Hi guys, I know it's been a bit of a break since you last heard me, but I swear I had a good reason. My third child was born a couple weeks ago, and so I've been quite busy with that, and I work at schools, and school year started last month, and it's been a bit hectic with uh, my other kids and so on. So, I do have a special treat for you. Yes, we are going to be getting back to episodes, but here is a voice actress interview that, um, well, I guess Zach's probably the best person to, to introduce. So, Zach, do your thing. The Echoes. The harmonies. They ring through our hallowed halls. They range a splendorous spanning of octaves, not one, not two, not three, but four. Dear listeners, it is she. A veritable virtuoso, a voice, an excellent example of expertise and entertainment, a true titan of tonality. We welcome today none other than the duly esteemed Lonnie Minella, founder and owner of the Audio Gods Voice Talent Agency. Ms. Minella has lent her more than considerable talents to film television, games, and radio for over three decades as not only a vocal performer, but producer and director. It was she whose eye for talent and vocal suitability helped shape the early Duke Nukem titles into the iconic experiences they are known to be. It is she whose talents have haunted many an XCOM 2 veteran's playthroughs as the chosen assassin. It is she whose voice gives life to the iconic detective Nancy Drew in 31 separate titles. And it is she who graces us with her presence this most joyous of days. Ms. Minella, you who brought life to every enemy in The Last of Us, you who lent voice to Super Smash Brothers, you who have brought joy and will continue to bring it as you narrate the upcoming and highly anticipated remake of the classic Halloween role-playing title Medieval, you who do us an honor we can never hope to repay. Your presence is celebrated here. Know that you are now, and always, welcome in the Fanatarium. So the style of this interview is going to be a bit different. I have been extremely busy, and our guest, Lani, has been extremely busy. And so what we did is we went all the way back to our original very first voice actor interview we ever did with James Arnold Taylor, where we sent him questions and then responded, uh, we recorded his answers, and we sent it back, and we formed an interview. We did the same with 10 questions for Lonnie. In the future, yes, we will be doing a live interview with her, a full one where we can talk back and forth. But we got questions from you guys. We sent 10 to her, and she responded in turn. So what we're going to do is I'm going to be reading the questions, and she's going to be responding, um, answering them as, uh, as you guys asked them. So without further ado... Let's get to question number one. Question one comes from Chance. Landing a title card character like Ivy from Soul Calibur comes with a lot of notoriety and directed work. By bringing the clickers, runners, and bloaters to life in The Last of Us, you shaped that world's ambience to an unforgettable level. To you personally, how does it feel to look back on those two very different styles of work? That's a very good question, Chance. With Ivy in Soul Calibur, usually we are looping over some animations on screen. We can provide some extra emotes, but the last time I recorded, they just basically used the attacks and whatever from previous Soul Calibers. And for the clickers and bloaters and infected, in the Last of Us game, you really have to be sometimes watching something that's going on on screen, but make up everything on your own, which can be quite challenging, but that's what's really fun about this job, is that you can really bring your own weirdness, and you never know what's going to come out of your mouth. That's what's so weird. And they love it. Usually they're just saying, like, wow, that's incredible. And one is a lot more exhausting than the other. Let me tell you, when you're doing the clickers and the bloaters, it goes on and on and on. And uh, boy, you really can work up a sweat. Question two. This one comes from Travis. Ivy Valentine. Fans of Soul Calibur have a complicated relationship with her visual portrayal. But it's no question she's iconic, especially with her commanding and sultry voice. I'd like to know what it's like slipping into a suggestive character that isn't really all that suggestive after all. Travis, that's always been my question is, how can Ivy fight with a chest like that? And I was just told, fan service, 
So I guess that's the best answer is that I feel a little bit embarrassed about that. But she's thankfully been in all of the Soul Calibur so far, and I hope that she remains. So you'll have to forgive me. I didn't design the character, but fan service is what that's all about. And we just, as actors, have to do what we're given. It's interesting, I have to say. I'm not going to be too overly concerned, but I have been criticized because they think that that's, you know, anti-feminist, but oh well. Question three. When it comes to a fighting game where the emphasis is on the action and fighting and story is often light, how set in stone is the script when you record? Do they do quick, easy sessions or do you come back due to story changes or script changes right away? Do they divide between story sessions and fight noise sessions? I'm glad your question addresses the script because usually that's where things fall apart and we get blamed for bad acting when it's possibly a bad script. I would say that when we don't even know the storyline, we don't even know the gameplay, which is most of the time we just do what we're told. Sometimes I would ask, is it okay if I add a hmm in front of I don't know? And that's usually acceptable, but we don't have a lot of time. A lot of these lines will pop up when you click on a character and they want them over and done with in a short period of time. So with text on screen support as well, we don't really take as long to drag things out because most gamers just click on the next thing and get off there because they've already read it and they don't want to waste time listening to us. To save our voice, those hard emotes like the attacks and the dying and all that are usually left till the end. Otherwise, we'd probably sound like a frog by the time we got done with those if we did them first. Question four, this one jumping to your Nintendo work. With Nintendo and Smash Brothers, many do not think of many lines in those games. How much recording is required for a Smash game? Do they give you more lines than they'd ever use in case of potential storylines, or do they mostly just give you battle sounds? As far as Nintendo goes, and going back to Smash Brothers and all the other games, the very first session I was flown up to Washington, up and back the same day, and most of it was, as you say, just various battle sounds and... I didn't know anything about the game. And since that time, they've just basically reused those sounds without us doing any new recording for every subsequent release. They have done that with a couple other actors, too, where we're not compensated for any of those other releases, even for the Koopalings or whatever. I wish they would come up with something new so we could entertain the fans better. So it's not our fault. Sorry. Continuing on with Smash Brothers, in Smash, you voice a lot of characters from various Koopas to Lucas. Do you have a favorite? Do you have any particular tactic, uh, or were you given any instructions about the varying Koopas, etc., when it comes to voicing? We can't really play favorites when it comes to characters, or some fan would hate us for liking something better than another. But I like the challenge of every new thing, and I believe, if I can remember back to 2008, we were just shown pictures of the Koopalings and said, come up with a voice for this. There wasn't a lot of direction, and again, being that it was a side-scroller with just various (laughs) things... (laughs) And not a lot was involved with pre-thought or direction. And I do believe there was a lot put in there as a library for future use. One last one when it comes to Nintendo. With Nintendo, are you dubbing from Japanese or is it a fresh recording in English as it is in Japanese? With Nintendo, especially when I was Professor Layton in the Curious Villages, Luke Triton and other characters, we are dubbing over the actual Japanese. But with Super Smash Brothers, if I recall correctly, we, we just made up our own things. So it just depends. And Maya and Fire Emblem, all those were, I believe, just recorded on their own. They were not dubbed over any existing animation. At least that's true for the last Halloween release they did. Now time for the last batch of kind of scattershot questions that cover lots of different games that you've been in. So you voice in Soul Calibur and Mortal Kombat, two very storied fighting game franchises. Was the approach to making the game as far as voicing goes different between the two games and companies, or was voicing Sindel and Shiva similar to voicing Ivy? With Mortal Kombat 9, when I did Sindel and Shiva, there was no animated stuff to loop over. It was all original, with a little more dialogue, as you know, and Ivy was again looped over existing Japanese footage. I think it was so Calibur 5 where I had my first experience with facial mocap, where they put the little dots all over your face and there's a, just a bunch of cameras, you know, and you're looking at a TV screen with no script and trying to read the subtext and looping over what you're watching. And I noticed that we may be seeing something from her 20 feet away doing a circular kick and the Japanese is something like, 
And I said, can I make it any better? And there was a lot of Japanese discussion like, oh, and they said, if you do like you see on screen, it's okay. <laughs> so yeah, with one, you're dealing with looping over existing footage and with a Mortal Kombat, it was all script only. And then the emotes came later, but I had to do different emotes for both characters. And they were surprised that I could sound different for the emotes for one character. They said, oh, we thought we would just pitch one down or something like that. But um, anyway, kind of sorry to see me being replaced, but it's all right. Everything has a purpose and it's time. Question eight. You've done a lot of work for Blizzard, especially in StarCraft. You voiced in the original StarCraft and again in StarCraft 2. How did the approach of Blizzard change when it came to the sequel? Did you notice yourself growing and changing as a voice actress in between? What changed? Were you more comfortable in the second game? I love these questions, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a background and insight as to how these game recordings usually work. You may be doing an audition. You may be just called up like Blizzard has done with me without an audition to do stuff for Hearthstone and StarCraft and Diablo and World of Warcraft. And yet, we definitely don't know much about the game at all. And if you're asking me with the difference between StarCraft 1 and 2, we didn't know anything. I was just told that instead of the dropship pilot, it's the same person that's now called the medevac pilot. And you look at the lines and you can find out that she's saying something is a joke or that maybe she's going to get blown up. But you find that out right at the session right then and there. So you really don't have time to create a character and evolve over time. It's just bam, 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 bam. There you go. And, you know, it's great. That's part of what being a pro is all about. Being able to do what you're asked to do. And pretty much it's like a cold read because... Often we never see the script until we're right there and the mic is turned on. And as far as in the pie, five by five, I copy that. I was simply told, remember the dropship pilot in Alien, which they didn't play for me. They said, well, it's like that. Just go ahead and do that voice or something close. The most fun we had was when we were recording the very first one, the audio guy's wife was a stewardess, a flight attendant, and she had those lines like, caution when exiting, your luggage may shift. The game memory didn't have a lot of room for many of those annoyance factor lines when you just keep clicking on a character and all of a sudden they'll say something funny. But I made up a lot of those, like, if you're going to hurl chunks, use the vomit bag in front of you. In the case of a water landing, you too can be used as a flotation device. I think there should be more of those because that adds a little bit more wit and humor to games, which oftentimes I think is sorely lacking. I thank Blizzard for allowing me to go wacky on that, and I think that the players liked it too. Oh, I definitely wholeheartedly agree. The fact that in early Blizzard games, especially just cl clicking on people, you get the funny responses. You know, from what I remember Warcraft 2, they started singing songs and so on. Um, yeah, even in StarCraft, those were those were a lot of fun to find, especially when you found like the extra funny ones. And I do remember yours in the original game because they were a lot of fun. Question 9. You've voiced in a lot of massive Sony PlayStation games, such as The Last of Us and God of War. Now you are the narrator as a storied franchise returns with Medieval. Could you share anything about that experience and what fans of the series of old and perhaps people who have never experienced it can expect this October when it is released? Ah, yes, Medieval. Very fun. A game that they did show me some gameplay of after we had done our session, at least the first session. And graphically and gameplay, it was amazing. The music was spectacular. I found out that most all of the other voices were kept just from the original, and a lot of fans will like that. The game was made easier to play and easier to figure out with some of those books that you normally would go and get clues from remaining open if you've already visited them. And I don't think I know too much else about what's new and what's old, except that they really have spiced it up and spruced it up, and a lot of people are extremely excited about it. I will tell you a little back secret, though. When we first were going to come up with a narrative voice, the idea that Sony had was to make it a radio puker. And I did about half an hour's worth of recording, I believe. And then I kind of said, you know, are we sure this works? It sounds really corny to me. And I said, what about sort of a Linda Hunt? And they said, well, let's hear that. Yeah, let's, let's go back and redo it that way. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a back secret for you. Thank you for that. I'm sure a lot of people are actually really excited for that series to return. And those who have never experienced it, they get to see you know, some of the old quirky side of original PlayStation 
you know, gaming. It was a lot of fun then. It looks to be a lot of fun now. And if people just open up to the quirky side and get away from the kind of seriousness of some of the games take, they should have a lot of fun. So question 10. You know, as always, if people want to follow your work, where do you recommend they go for the newest and best updates and perhaps to keep in contact? I would love to thank all my fans and supporters for over the years. I never realized sometimes how much somebody likes a certain character, such as Lucas from Smash Brothers, or I know that Nancy Drew had a big following, Ivy does. And I'm just amazed when I get some sort of a reaction on Twitter at Lonnie Manella's, my handle there. And you can check out things that IMDB posts if you look me up there. I appreciate the clicks. My personal website is LonnieManella.com. Credits and resumes are sometimes updated there, but as you're well aware, we're not supposed to announce anything until it's out. So I try to keep that up as much as possible, but you're always welcome to try and send me an email. And please, if you can tell your friends to click on my IMDb page, that is greatly, greatly appreciated. And it's amazing how sometimes we can't talk about anything for a year and a half. And I always have to check because, yeah, you can get in trouble if you talk about things before that they are announced or before they are released. And I've learned my lesson, let me tell you. But thanks again for everything. And whatever I can do to help, let me know. And I appreciate this chance to be with you. PK, thank you. Live lively and prosper. <laughs> Dare to play. And that's a wrap. Thank you, Lonnie Manella, for your fantastic work and all you've been able to do. And yes, we will have her on again in the future for a full interview. And we do have some of those coming up uh, in the near future. My son's a bit older now, so we should be able to get some of these done in the near future. But of course, we have lots of stuff on our YouTube channel. We have My Odin's Beard, a Marvel podcast. We have the Justice Cast talking about DC. We have uh, book, and book reviews. We have movie reviews. Of course, we also have a series which I've been doing recently about all the streaming services. I'm eight or nine episodes in and I haven't even talked about any of the big ones yet. So I talk about all the free and paid streaming services, what they offer and what's good and what's not um, from Canopy to IMBD, IMBD TV to Hulu to DC Universe to Tubi TV to Vudu and everything in between. A lot of great stuff there. So I hope you guys check it out. And of course, our main feed will have the fan interior interviews and Let's Talk Fandom. And of course, uh, stuff that dreams are made of as well. But for now, as always, 